Um, my name is Marlene Linares Gonzalez. I am the Communication and Outreach Coordinator at the Latin American and Iberian Institute at the University of New Mexico. Uh, the Latin American and Iberian Institute promotes and supports interdisciplinary teaching, research, and meaningful public engagement to advance the production and dissemination of knowledge about Latin America and Iberia. Latin America is designated as one of seven priority areas of research for UNM, and we proudly contribute to both the university's intellectual community as well as global discourse through public programming. We'd like to take a moment to recognize the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia on which UNM sits on. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our community relationship to indigenous people. And now I'd like to pass it to Dr. Luis Eran Avila from the UNM Department of History who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Marlene, and uh, of course to the LAII for uh, facilitating this uh, event. To the uh, to my own department, I mean, I'll thank myself, but also my department for uh, also the support uh, uh, for for this event. Uh, I mean, it is really a, a big uh, pleasure for me to introduce a very dear colleague and very dear friend, Gemma Clopez Santa Maria, uh, who's going to be uh, today presenting. Uh, to us this uh, talk titled Martyrs, Fanatics, and Pious Militants, Religious Violence and the Secular State in 1930s Mexico. Um, I'll say a, a little bit about uh, uh, Dr. Clope Santa Maria. She's a historian and a sociologist specializing in violence, religion, gender, and state formation in 20th and 20th, uh, 21st century uh, Latin America. She's currently an assistant professor of Latin American history at, at Loyola University, Chicago. She's the author of a recent book, which I should, I thought I had handy, but I don't. But her recent book, um, In the Vortex of Violence, Lynching, Extralegal Justice, and the State in Post-Revolutionary Mexico, published by uh, University of California Press just last year. She's also the lead editor of uh, Violence and Crime in Latin America, Representations and Politics, which I had the uh, privilege to collaborate with her and other dear colleagues. Uh, her work has been featured uh, in, uh, or is forthcoming in the Journal of Latin American Studies, Latin American Research Review, The Americas, and the Journal of Social History. She's also, uh, and congratulations, Ian Kema, for this, the re recipient of a Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation Research Grant. Uh, for her new um, a project on uh, religion and violence, which is what she will be talking about today. And uh, again, uh, welcome uh, Hema to, uh, I mean, virtually to UNM and to this space that uh, the Latin American Institute and the History Department have uh, provided for us. Uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here today. Uh, so I wanna thank uh, Marlene Linares Gonzalez, uh, the Latin American and uh, Institute, Latin American and Iberian Institute, and also the Department of History, and of course my dear friend and colleague Dr. Luis Ranavila, and and everybody that is here today. Uh, it's, it's truly a privilege to share with you um, this presentation. Um, this is a work in progress, and so I really appreciate the chance to 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 present this with you, and I welcome your ideas, suggestions as to what you believe can be, um, what can make the, this, 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 this presentation uh, stronger, or, or rather the paper is stronger. Uh, and I should say that, yes, this is part of my new research uh, that tries to examine the contentious relationship between religion and violence in Mexico. And the larger project, the idea is to look at a, at a longer period, like so beginning in the 1920s and, and hopefully uh, uh, arriving up until today, now trying to see like the, the question of how Catholics have responded to drug-related violence in contemporary Mexico. So um, I'll start. So uh, in October of 1931, Catholic villagers from the town, the town of Tlapacoyan in Veracruz marched towards the municipal building armed with pistols and machetes. Once there, they surrounded the structure and set fire to it. A group of officials who were inside the building died in the incident, while others were shot by the rioters. The anger of perpetrators was such that they decapitated some of the victims after killing them. 
The National Daily La Prensa described the incident as an expression of the seditious activities of some fanatics and explained the attack was organized in retaliation for the warning of saints that municipal authorities had carried out days earlier inside the town's church. A few years later, in November of 1935, a group of federal police officers killed Clemente Mendoza, a well-known Catholic vigilante leader suspected of hanging, mutilating, and slaying dozens of socialist teachers in the state of Puebla in central Mexico. Among Mendoza's belongings, federal police officers found anti-socialist propaganda, a list with names of teachers that imparted socialist education, as well as a prayer of penitence written on a piece of paper. The prayer read, merciful Jesus, wash away my disgrace, clean my sins by your cross, by your death, by my Holy Mother of Guadalupe, forgive me. I do not want to fight, nor live, nor die, if it is not for your church and for you. Holy Mother of Guadalupe, join this poor sinner in his agony and may his last cry on earth and his first chant in heaven be, Viva Cristo, Le Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King. Newspaper and government officials were quick to refer to these and similar examples as proof of Catholics, fanaticism, ignorance, and proclivity to violent and irrational conduct. Evidence suggests, however, that the relation between religion and violence was far more complex, and that Catholics' reactions to the post-revolutionary state were not merely a result of irrationality, misinformation, or misguidance. Despite the formal end of the Cristero War, 1926-1929, which is Mexico's conflict over the, over the religious questions, Catholics continued to experience assaults over the symbolic, communal, and spiritual dimensions of their faith. The arrest and expulsion of Catholic priests, the, the closing down of churches, the stealing and burning of religious images, and the implementation of a socialist model of education were all part of an official campaign that sought to forge a rational and secular model of citizenry, free from the backward, and in backward influence of the Catholic Church. The aim of this talk is to examine the cultural and political repertoire that contributed to Catholics' understanding of violence as a legitimate means to resist the secular state in 1930s Mexico. In order to do so, I will analyze a series of violent events perpetrated by Catholic militants, including riots, lynchings, as well as the torture and assassination of impious elements, which took place in Mexico City, as well as in the states of Veracruz, Jalisco, and Puebla. My analysis is based on several documents, including correspondence, propaganda, poems, and reports produced by Catholics, individuals, and organizations, but also by uh, reports produced by government uh, documents, as well as newspaper articles. The argument that I wish to put forward today is twofold. First, that contrary to official representations of Catholic re religion as a top-down, monolithic, and unchanging set of institutions and practices that promoted recalcitrant and extremist forms of religious militancy, Catholics were in fact deeply divided, and these along theological, moral, and practical grounds regarding the legitimacy and desirability of violence. These divisions were expressed not only in the bitter disagreements that surfaced between the clergy and lay organizations, but also in the tensions that existed among members of the Catholic hierarchy itself, including diocesan priests, bishops, and representatives of the Holy See. Secondly, I argue that Catholic militants justify their use of violence based on non-canonical, flexible, and popular, and by this I mean as opposed to institutionally sanctioned, interpretations of martyrdom and sacrifice as well as on a radical and uncompromising understanding of politics that regarded the post-revolutionary state and its representatives as a fundamental threat to Catholics' spiritual, moral, and communal integrity. Although the Mexican government portrayed re religious militants as fanatical, a representation that reified the notion that Catholics were driven by religious frenzy and irrational impulses, evidence suggests that Catholics' use of violence was fully political and aimed at bringing what they perceived as a tyrannical and godless government to an end. In order, in order to develop both arguments, I will first examine how the notion of religious martyrdom was reinterpreted by Catholic militants in a way that contrary to canonical understandings of the concept, which are centered on piety, moderation, and restraint, recognize belligerent individuals as martyrs also, regardless of their use of violence. 
Second, I will analyze the disagreements that existed between the Mexican Episcopate and militant organizations, such as the Liga Nacional Defensora de la Libertad Religiosa, National League for the Defense of Religious Liberty, also known as the Liga, as La Liga, in order to illuminate the divisions that existed between the clergy and lay organizations, as well as within the clergy itself, regarding the role that violence ought to have in the defense of Catholic practices and beliefs during this period. Okay, so let me start with the first part. The year 1931 was marked by, by a series of violent events confronting Catholics and anti-clerical officials in the state of Veracruz. A few months before the state sponsor burning of saints mentioned in my opening remarks, a young former seminarian attempted to murder Veracruz governor Adalberto Tejeda. The governor's bodyguards killed the perpetrator, Rafael Ramirez Frias. Although Tejeda survived the attack with only a minor injury, the same day, a group of his supporters set fire to a number of churches, altars, and saints, and attacked the Asuncion Cathedral in Jalapa in retaliation for the attempted murder. The group of assailants wounded two priests and killed another one in front of hundreds of children that were receiving catechism lessons. The murdered priest, Darío Acosta, became a martyr in the eyes of Catholics. The attempted murder against Governor Tejeda and the incidents that follow took place in the context of the implementation of a new state law, Law 197, which limited the number of priests to one per 10,000 inhabitants in Veracruz. Tejeda enacted some of the most stringent anti-clerical policies during the 1930s, in clear defiance to the more cautious and moderate, pro a moderate position promoted by the federal government at the time. Next to limited the number of priests, Tejeda fostered the defanatization of the masses through socialist education and the desacralization and defilement of, defilement of churches and places of religious worship. Both the attempted murder against the government and the attack against Catholic priests were the subject of a heated debate between Tejeda and Bishop, Bishop of Veracruz, Rafael Guizar y Valencia. In a letter to the governor, Guizar y Valencia stated he had recently received the news of the tragic events caused by the tyrannical law promoted by the governor against the church. He then decried Tejeda's religious persecution by stating, Señor Tejeda, Veracruz is bath in the blood of martyrs but their blood will result in truth, justice, and religion becoming stronger despite your tyrannical forces. As reflected by this quote, Guisari Valencia referred to martyrdom as a powerful symbol that could inspire and mobilize Catholics by invigorating their beliefs and exposing the injustices of the secular state. Because the assailed priests had been targets of violence while practicing their faith, their place as martyrs was irrefutable in canonical terms. For the anticlerical Tejeda, however, Guisari Valencia's celebration of these priests as martyrs was two-faced, as it ignored the fact that many religious individuals had used violence to advance their cause. In his response to, his, to the bishop, Tejeda called the bishop a hypocrite for calling martyrs individuals that had acted as murderers and common criminals, and he referred to Rafael Ramirez Frias, the person that attempted to, uh, to, to kill him. Uh, but he also referred to the young Catholic, Jose Leon de Toral, who had murdered Mexico's president-elect Álvaro Obregón in 1928. He asserted that he and the many other revolutionaries assassinated by the clergy were the real martyrs. Although Tejeda's attempt to present Obregón and himself as martyrs may come across as crude, it did not differ greatly from the attempt made, made by the federal government and by sympathetic organizations to memorialize the revolutionaries that had died at the hands of so-called religious fanatics. Socialist teachers in particular were repeatedly presented as individuals that had bravely and innocently died at the hands of fanatics to defend the ideals of the revolution. And I should say here that these socialist teachers were basically rural teachers that were sent um, to different towns in order to uh, promote alphabetization campaigns, literacy campaigns, sorry, but also uh, agrarian reform and secularization policies. No? So these are, this is what I mean by the socialist teachers. So there were these representatives of the state. 
For instance, at the end of the 1930s, the Secretaría de Educación Pública, the Education Minister, commissioned a collection of lithographs authored by Artis Leopoldo Mendes, which vividly represented the sacrifice of teachers at the hands of Catholic mobs and groups of vigilantes. While teachers were consistently presented as young and suffering individuals who died while performing their duties, Catholics were depicted as faceless mobs or wicked individuals with coarse features. In one of these lithographs, um, titled Professor Juan Martin Escobar, the spirit of a young teacher is shown pointing at his murderer. The teacher is accompanied by hundreds of peasants whose eyes, wide open, offer testimony to the crime. The assassin, in turn, is shown with a malicious expression, holding a knife in his hand and wearing a mask of a suffering Jesus Christ. The underlying message could not be clearer. The teacher was the real martyr, while the deceitful Catholic assassin used the image of Christ to justify his action. And I wanted to show other examples of this series of lithographs, uh, which are very um, you know, impressive in terms of the violence that they represent. The conflict and disagreement regarding who should be considered a martyr surfaced also in the case of the killings that took place in December of 1934. Uh, on that day, dozens of red shirts had gathered in front of a church located in the Coyoacán neighborhood in Mexico City. The red shirts was an organization created by Tomás Garrido Canaval, former governor of Tabasco and then secretary of agriculture under President Cárdenas. Garrido Canaval shared the fervent anti-clericalism of Tejeda and envisioned the red shirts as part of his strategy to de-Christianize Mexican society. On the day of the incident, the young men stood outside the church shouting anti-religious diatribes while the faithful listened to their morning mass. When Catholics came out of mass, they confronted the red shirts who were armed with pistols and attacked them with the stones and daggers. After the red shirts shot the group of church goers, resulting in the killing of five and the wounded, wounding of many more, a mob of infuriated Catholics lynched Ernesto Malda, a young member of the group who had arrived late to the red shirts gathering. Reporting on the incident, the government's mouthpiece uh, newspaper El Nacional barely mentioned the names of the Catholic victims, while it described at length the torment and suffering that Ernesto Malda had endured in the hands of this fanaticized mob. It narrated how Malda's skull had pieces of scalp and hair missing, which had been ripped off by his victimizers. The report also referred to the more than 80 cuts found in his chest, arms, and back. These and other articles emphasized the fanatic and irrational conduct of the Catholic mob and reported that church boys had been incited by the priests and encouraged to assail the young anti-clericals. During the days following the Coyoacan clashes, each group organized public funerals for their victims and articulated a narrative of martyrdom in connection to their death. The young group of anti-clericals organized a funeral for Ernesto Malda, where they carried his coffin wrapped in the red and black flag and compared Malda's death to that of Obregón, who had been sacrificed by the clergy. Catholics, on their part, formed the Club of the Assassinated of Coyoacán and announced their plans to organize a nationwide campaign to demand the resignation of Garrido Canaval, the dismissal of the Coyoacán police delegate, and the vigorous persecution of the red shirts. Thousands of people attended both the funeral of Malda and those of the five Catholics. For anti-clericals and supporters of the red shirts, Malda was a martyr of religious fanaticism. Catholics, in turn, honored the death of the five Catholics and considered them martyrs who had died at the hands of the anti-clerical and impious red shirts. Catholics were particularly keen on the story of Maria de la Luz Camacho a young female member of Acción Católica Mex Mexicana, Mexican Catholic Action, whose last words as she was being shot were Viva Cristo Rey. Camacho came to be seen as the first martyr of the ACM, and Catholics saw in the story of her killing a testament of the state's continuous war against Catholic religion. The fact that Maria de la Luz Camacho was part of the ACM, which embodied the church strategy to promote civil and pacific forms of resistance during this decade 
made her martyrdom indisputable in the eyes of both laity and, clear, and clergy. Mary, Maria de la Luz was certainly not the first Cristero martyr. Perhaps the most documented case of martyrdom in 20th century Mexico is that of Miguel Agustin Pro, the Jesuit priest who was executed by orders of President Calles on November 23 of 1927 in the context of the Cristero War. Detained and executed without trial due to his alleged participation in a failed attempt to assassinate former president and then presidential candidate Alvaro Obregón, Pro became immediately a martyr in the view of Catholics. Despite his sympathies for the Cristero uprising, Miguel Pro was widely known for his piety and his engagement in civil forms of religious activism. More so, the image of his execution with his arms stretching in the shape of a cross further contributed to Miguel Pro's standing as a symbol of both Catholic Pacific resistance on the one hand and the immorality and unjust violence unleashed by the Mexican government on the other. The Vatican beatified Miguel Pro on September of 1988 as a martyr that had been killed in, in hatred of the faith. Catholics agree upon the martyrdom of Miguel Agustin Pro and Maria de la Luz Camacho, just like they did in regards to the murdered priest of Veracruz, Darío Acosta. Catholics agreed on the significance of their deaths and the suffering they had endured, stoically and with a recourse to violence at the hands of a tyrannical government. Less conventional, however, and more controversial, was the martyrdom of Luis Segura Vilches, the engineer who confessed being the sole author and mastermind behind that 1927 attack against Álvaro Obregón. An active member of the Acción Católica de la Juventud Mexicana, ACJM, and of the armed struggle organized by the Liga, Segura was executed by firing squad together with Miguel Pro. Church authorities, however, did not recognize Segura as a martyr and remained for the most part silent about his death. Segura's direct involvement in a violent act disqualified him as a martyr in canonical terms and equally important went against the Mexican Episcopate's efforts to distance itself from violent forms of religious militancy. Despite the church's position, militant Catholics did regard Segura's actions and death as evidence of his martyrdom. An undated poem written by Cristero poet Jorge Telles, for, for example, reflects an alternative understanding of martyrdom articulated by those Catholics who sympathize with the armed struggle. The poem makes direct reference to Luis Segura as well as to Juan Tirado, who was also executed in connection to the attempt against Obregón, and refers to them as holy victims of unjust laws, uh, as the blood of martyrs, young and pure, a holy offer before the heavens. Infused with religious metaphors and Christian references, the poem invokes an understanding of martyrdom that celebrates the profusion of blood and the notion of sacrificial violence in the name of Christ. Towards the end, the poet refers to the cross of the Father, symbol of the sky, as an august banner for combat, an allegory that captures the outdoor celebration of Catholic belligerence. Such view of martyrdom which celebrated the virility and courage of young men, as well as their willingness to use violence, was shared by several young Catholic radicals, but was unwelcome by those Catholics who believed that violent forms of militancy could undermine the legitimacy of their cause. Equally controversial and divisive was the martyrdom of Jose de Leon Toral, the young Catholic militant who actually succeeded in his attempt to murder Obregón on July 17 of 1928. Toral, who was executed by firing squad in February of 1929, endured several forms of torture at the hands of his interrogators while in prison, which he documented through his writings and drawings. It was this torment and the suffering he endured what constituted the basis for his martyrdom in the view of, contem of contemporary militant Catholics. More so, but for more recalcitrant Catholics, particularly younger members of ACJM and the Liga, the idea of an individual not only dying, but also killing for Christ while exposing the tyranny of the government was a genuine manifestation of religious martyrdom. This view clearly contrasted with the understanding of martyrdom sanctioned by the Mexican Episcopate, which did not recognize Leon Toral as a martyr and instead condemned 
his actions. The ambivalent and contested meaning of martyrdom in relation to violence would continue to surface in the following months and well into the 1930s. Jesuit priest Cesario Alba, in a correspondence with Catholic militant Andres Barquini Ruiz, discussed, for instance, the possibility that Catholics who had participated in the armed rebellion could be considered martyrs. Although he acknowledged that some theologians say expressively, and I quote, that those who die with a weapon in their hand while defending the faith are not martyrs, he referred to St. John of Arc, the famous Catholic warrior who was canonized by the church as an example of a combative and legitimate figure of religious militancy. As this exchange made clear, the meanings of martyrdom were not constrained by formal theological interpretations or by the official position of the Catholic Church. Similar to the church inability to control the meanings of martyrdom, the Mexican Episcopate lacked the means to fully discipline and pacify the hundreds of Catholics that continued to resort to violence and armed forms of resistance during the 1930s. So in the next sec section, I will examine briefly the tensions that existed between the church and religious militants, including some local priests, as reflected in the controversies that emerged between the Mexican Episcopate and members of the Liga during this period. So at the end of the Cristero War, the Mexican Episcopate tried to tame the activities of recalcitrant and militant Catholics, including members of the Liga, who were known for their ongoing support of belligerent forms of religious militancy. The relation between the Liga and the Mexican Episcopate had been strained from the moment the church hierarchy opened channels of dialogue and negotiation with the government during the 1920s. The Liga openly condemned the Episcopate's strategy of negotiating with authorities that had consistently attacked their faith. In their view, Mexican Catholics could not expect a government that had declared itself an enemy of religion to behave in any way that would guarantee religious freedom or even a minimal respect for Catholics' most cherished values and tradition. In a long and bitter letter sent by members of the Liga to the Archbishop of Mexico, Pascual Diaz, on September of 1931, they expressed their disappointment with the Mexican Episcopate's condemnation of the Liga. The authors reminded Pascual Diaz that when Catholics decided to take up arms in the face of religious persecution, the Catholic people, el pueblo católico, asked the Liga to lead the armed movement. They also reminded him that he, in his prior role as secretary of the Mexican Episcopate, together with Leopoldo Ruiz y Flores, then apostolic delegate, had, and I quote, committed to not condemn the armed movement, to lend moral support to carry out our program, and to allow those priests that requested it to serve as chaplains of the Liberation Army, end of quote. They next condemned the Episcopate's unfair hostility towards the Liga. In particular, they referred to an occasion where in Pascual Diaz had and I quote, mortally attacked the executive committee of the Liga, stating that we were rebels to the authority of the Pope. This letter is revealing in many ways, uh, sorry, and, and they also say that this in their mind was a declaration of war that put them, and they call themselves genuine Catholics, in a very difficult and embarrassing position. So this letter is revealing in many ways. It shows the Liga's inconformity with the highest religious authorities in Mexico, and the fact that its members were convinced of the validity of their demands, despite the lack of approval on behalf of the hierarchy. Other documents issued by the Liga were even more vocal in their critique of the church official position. In a piece of propaganda published by the organization, members of the Liga challenged the authority of the Vatican itself. The Liga produced the, this document in response to a series of declarations made by Leopoldo Ruiz y Flores in 1932, which were meant to convey to the Mexican faithful that the Vatican rejected the use of armed defense and instead endorsed nonviolent forms of resistance vis-a-vis -vis the Mexican state. So in the document, the authors stated, and I quote, it is not justified for the Pope and the bishops to prohibit this resource, meaning, armed defense. Given the imminent state of ruin of religion at the motherland due to adher adhering to such a system of pacifism at all costs, Catholics can and should appeal to arms despite of that prohibition. 
since discipline is not the end of the church, but it is rather the salvation of souls. They also claim that the Pope could not have condemned a natural right, such as people's rights to defend themselves from an unjust and evident aggression, expressing that it would be a contradiction for the Holy Father to condemn Catholics' recourse to arms in a moment when religion was being seriously threatened. Um, lastly, they expressed that given that the Pope and the Mexican bishops were mistaken, Catholics were not bound to follow them or obey them, as this would mean failing God in our own conscience. Instead, they claim their prayers and conscious study of the holy doctrine would soon reveal that their appeal to arms was lawful and legitimate despite the church prohibitions. Members of the Liga's appeal to religious doctrine and to prayer as a source of knowledge to elucidate the path they needed to follow reveals an understanding of religions, religious faith and action that relied on individual judgment rather than on established rules. This contrast with Mexican's government's portrayal of Catholics as being blindly manipulated by the church hierarchy or being driven by pure fanatic impulses. It shows both their willingness to strategically appropriate religious principles and values as well as to challenge the church official view in order to advance their political goals. Certainly, not all Catholics agree with the Liga's position in regards to the legitimacy of violence, and less so with the organization's over defiance of church authorities. For instance, uh, in March of 1933, Alfonso Sanchez de la Peña, a Catholic, sends a letter to priest Manuel Martinez to inform him about a meeting organized by members of the league in a neighborhood in Mexico City, a meeting that he claimed was attended by 600 people. In the letter, he denounced that members of the league read poems of belligerent character and staged a play where they, and I quote, openly incited an armed rebellion against the current government under the pretext of tyranny. He said also that uh, the more outrageous were attacks against, and I quote, our bishops and priests, saying that the Mexican Episcopate and all priests were schematic since they opposed the, wish, the wishes of your holiness, the Pope. From the tone of the letter, we can infer that the author believed his addressee, the priest Manuel Martinez, shared his outrage and rejection towards the Liga's position. The clergy, however, was itself divided regarding the strategy of dialogue and reconciliation adopted by the Mexican Episcopate. In January of 1934, for instance, priest Jose Adolfo Arroyo wrote a statement where he openly criticized the arreglos and the work of Acción Católica, which he deemed unworthy and immodest. He also condemned those, uh, those Catholics that referred to Cristeros as bandits as bandits and machiti Catholics with sarcasm and contempt. The letter concluded by saying that the clergy was responsible for the ongoing hostilities experienced by Catholics on behalf of Mexican authorities. Aware of the fact that many priests, such as the author of the above mentioned statement, favor the continuation of armed resistance, the higher ranks of the church made constant efforts to ensure the government that no priests were involved, in, were involved in acts of political agitation. In addition to informing the government about the church commitment to nonviolence, the Mexican Episcopate monitored the activities of priests and their potential involvement in armed resistance. In September of 1935, for instance, the secretary of the Executive Episcopal Committee investigated the possible involvement of priests in the Second Cristiada, a sequel of the Cristero War driven by the implementation of socialist education and by the state's ongoing anti-clerical campaigns. Although in this report, the Episcopal Committee claimed they had found that no priest was involved in such movement, evidence suggests priests were indeed involved in seditious activities. During the years 1934 to 1938 in particular, several priests condoned and provided, the, the, provided moral and religious support to those Catholics that decided to oppose through violent means the implementation of socialist education. Catholics' actions against teachers included, included the rape, mutilation, hanging, burning, and torture of dozens of male and female teachers 
either at the hands of vigilantes or more spontaneous mobs. And here I just present a picture of the, uh, like some teachers that come to Mexico City and the most common form of mutilation was the mutilation of ears. So these are two teachers that come to Mexico City to demand justice from uh, President Cárdenas. And we can comment a little bit more about this image because for me, it's interesting that they almost look like nuns, no? but these were like socialist teachers um, attacked by Catholics. The status that priests had within Catholic communities was central in shaping the sentiments of Catholics towards socialist teachers as both spiritual leaders and influential political actors who form alliances with local economic and political elites, parish priests could sway people's perception about the immorality of socialist education. Furthermore, in their communications and statements, church authorities clearly conveyed the faithful that they had the obligation to resist socialist education due to its atheist, corrupt, and anti-Catholic nature. For instance, in his pastoral letter of April 12 of 1936, Archbishop of Guadalajara, Jose Garibi Rivera, condemned socialist education as a source of immorality and danger, a means to destroy the faith of teachers and students, and a source, and a source of slander against the, teacher, the teachings of the church. He next encouraged laity and clergy to mobilize all means possible in order to make sure children would receive their proper religious education. Beyond opposition to socialist education, pre supported the ongoing activities of the Liga, which against the dictates of the Catholic hierarchy, promoted armed resistance. For instance, in February of 1936, over 1,000 over 1, peasants and members of the Liga organized a meeting in Mexico City. The meeting was preceded by a group of priests who blessed Liga members as soldiers and a quote, prepared to offer their, their blood for the Cristero cause. The meeting was held uh, with participants that had the Cristero banner and the flags of regional chapters of the Liga. The priests inaugurated the event, blessed the flags, and read passages from the Bible. In the ceremony, which also marked the seventh anniversary of Jose de Leon Toral's execution, Participants referred to his heroic sacrifice, courage, and patriotism, and encouraged more Catholics to follow the path left by the steps of, this, uh, of his generous blood. As this example suggests, the priest's presence and words, together with the references to heroic and sacrificial violence, infused this meeting with religious significance. They further contributed to a notion of martyrdom that went beyond the canonical understanding of a martyr as he who is willing to die for his faith and that incorporated instead the figure of the hero or the warrior. The combination of religious symbols and rituals on behalf of the Liga attendees, including the use of an altar, the blending of prayers and calls for belligerent actions, illustrate the ways in which Catholics use ritualistic elements of their faith to infuse their political goals. Condemned by the Catholic hierarchy and persecuted by the Mexican government, the Liga became, began to lose presence and strength by the end of the 1930s. The practices and ideology of this organization, however, sheds light on the manifold contradictions and divisions that informed the relationship between violence and religion during this decade. In particular, it brings to the fore the ways in which Catholic support of violence was not rooted in a fanatic obedience of the church or on pure religious frenzy. Instead, it was based on a non-canonical and it was based on non-canonical and popular interpretations of religious principles, as well as on an, on an uncompromising understanding of politics that placed the state and its representatives as an enemy that threatened Catholics' moral and religious integrity, as well as the possibility of building a Catholic nation. So let me just, as a way of conclusion, say that violence uh, was at the center of the religious experience in both revolutionary and post-revolutionary Mexico, and in this particular decade, even after the end of the Cristero War be it as an expression of religious persecution or of belligerent forms of religious militancy, the study of violence is central to understanding how religion has been lived and experienced by Mexican citizens and communities more broadly. A scholarly literature has, however, for the most part, failed to provide a systematic analysis of the contentious and complex relationship between religion and violence in Mexico. 
There exists certainly a rich and vast historiography dealing with the Cristero War, but such literature is centered for the most part on the armed conflict and on the reasons that prompted Catholics to take up arms against the post-revolutionary state. In most analysis, however, violence appears merely as a byproduct of the armed conflict, but it is not a study in its own right or in terms of its more spontaneous manifestations such as rioting and lynching. The analysis of martyrdom that I have offered here today based on both widely accepted and also contentious martyrs, it speaks to the ways in which religious militants infuse politics and the recourse to violence with sacred meanings. This, together with examination of the disagreements that existed between the Mexican Episcopate and militant organizations like the Liga, offer a window into the cultural and political repertoire that served to justify the use of violence in the eyes of belligerent Catholics. Thank you.